morning, everybody. This is Kevin, and as you can see, I'm on another Zoom chat, and I'm with uh, Elizabeth Helston and Andrew okay. Norris. Well, good morning to you both. Good morning. I'm, I'm assuming it's still good morning where you are, Andrew, in Croatia. Yeah, it's only 11 o'clock here. All right. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> So we've um, we've uh, come onto the Zoom chat today to again again talk about um, poems, and the theme for this one is winter. And I know Liz has been busy getting something ready and to record that I can then put onto uh, onto this video chat. And Andrew was already very keen to get to his stuff into me, so I've got that. Um, and even I have delved into doing some writing. Um, okay. and, um, but I'm not an expert. Five of the means of I an expert. So tell me both, you know, we've talked about poems and your thoughts about words and things like that. So, so Liz, when you think about poems and, and things like that for winter, what, what are your main thoughts of, about that? What, what, do you, what do you look into? Well, I suppose being English, I always think about winter as in this country, which is cold and uh, damp and not necessarily snowy, sadly. Um, um, but it, 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 we have actually lived in the Middle East and although the seasons change over there as they do here, of course, it's very different. I mean, it takes about literally five days to change the season. Um, where, and um, I noticed it, particularly autumn, actually, but at uh, this time of year, it's, um, it, it is cooler <laughs> and the days are shorter, but it, it, um, it's, it's, it's very lovely, but you can have um, sandstorms. <clears throat> yeah, of course. Snowstorms. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I, I actually ap appreciate, I suppose, an English um, winter more oh. as a result of that than before, even though I feel the cold. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's something we all suffer from as we get a little bit older. <laughs> oh, is that it? Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I certainly do. I, I never used to feel the cold at all, but um, now I'm, I'm getting closer to my, to my 70th year. Um, I do feel the cold a lot more. Um, so when I go out, whether it be walking or golfing, I've got layers on, and it's, it's, yeah, if I get too hot, I have to start peeling them all off. But uh, um, but the same question to you, Andrew. Um, well, I I always think about my my relation to the seasons and how I re respond to them. Um, how like you and Liz, you know, as we get older, we both feel the cold more. But I'm interested in in uh, the interaction with myself, with with the landscape, and how the landscape responds to nature to the seasons and i think the two poems that i've chosen kind of reflect that in a way mm, yeah absolutely yeah yeah they're, they're really good um yeah and uh i, I, I love the way that yours are, are, are really short <laughs> it's, 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 uh, I'll, I'll wait for i'll wait for this poem to come through from andrew and it's going to be perhaps i don't know about you know this long but it's not it's it's not this but it's very short very sweet but no absolutely and uh it, it, you, you get the meaning of winter immediately from them well i think that you can encapsulate uh, a season uh mm. and one's response to it in in just a few short lines and i think particularly the edward thomas poem which i chose the second poem mm. uh will, will illustrate this and um what I found particularly interesting about this Edward Thomas poem called <clears throat> Thor was how he reflected in a way the failings of, of humans to appreciate on the ground uh, the changes in nature, whereas a bird up in the, the sky was much better equipped to observe nature and the landscape. Those of you who know me and know my work know that I've been living largely in a little Croatian village where for the past 15, 18 years, I've been documenting the lives of the people, the landscape, their cultures and traditions in paintings, mostly in videos, in music, but also in, in poetry. And I put out this little publication around 2008, and I wanted to write these duologues. They're not conversations. They are two points of view of the landscape over a different period of time. 
And so I wanted to imagine how Mate, the man who built our house, how he viewed the landscape. And it must have been very hard work for him to work the land, as opposed to mine, which is a rather romanticised version of what life living off the land is. So I'd like to give you an example for winter. It is dark out, pitch black. No sound from the meadow except for the top of a plum tree breaking off, burdened under the weight of snow. snow it has been falling, falling all night, night, muting all other voices. Drifts have reached halfway up the front door, lying just under the ledge of the windows. The, the house, house is increasingly, increasingly cut off. closed off. The neighbours are becoming more distant. I move closer to the fire, his fire. I need that broken wood. It would be useful now. And add another log to keep out the cold. The animals are asleep below. No one stirs. It is so silent outside. outside. Not even a dog bark. And here is another entry, which is a, just a short observation poem. At night a veil comes down. The brittle wind blows and sculpts the snow into streamlined, crystalline drifts, transforming the orchard into an aisle of Gothic arches. All reference points are obscured and softened. No one from the village walks out, yet by morning, Neat sets of deer prints seem to wander effortlessly across the bottom field. We were here, they seem to say, while you were sleeping. And the last poem is about my experiences in the landscape in winter. Judging through snow, all has succumbed to sleep below a dense white covering. The landscape's stored energy is waiting for an incentive and that particular imperative to grow. All has been woven into whiteness. Each knotted stitch of thread stretches to my foot's depression as I struggle cautiously for balance and so as not to wake from unresolved dreams, the wilderness and the village from hibernation. And I, I will come on to that a little bit more when we talk about that poem. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, for me, you know, when, after talking to you and Liz, when we did the first Zoom chat about uh, poetry and poems and, and words and things like that, nothing really sort of inspired me to start writing. But when was it? November the 11th last year, um, when we start thinking about, war different subject about war i just felt i had to sit and write something and i don't know why that came to me but i just felt i had to and i think you've both you've both read what what i did and for me it was just i sat and and, and typed as things come into my head i just sat and typed things down and I've done other things as well, which which neither of you are aware of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's the same process for me. Um, literally, just as things come into my head, I'm I'm typing them down. I change them as I go. And I think it's it would be the same for me as if if you know with with seasons. If I was doing something about seasons, I, I would have to have some sort of a, a spark to get, get me going and then to, to follow that on from there. But how do you, when you, when you write something, how do you process it and how, how do you go about that? Go to you, well, uh, Andrew. Um, the, the first selection of poems I, I sent you were, I wrote about 13 years ago in this little volume called Field yeah. Songs. Sure. And what I was interested in was um, a spatial composition. So I, I imagined how Mate, the man who built our house, how he responded to the seasons, to working the land, um, with, in a much more realistic perspective, whereas 
my contribution is a slightly more romanticized view of, of being engaged in the lad. And so the poems are parallel monologues. It's not a conversation because they occur over time. So Matta's point of view occurred, I would say, you know, 50 years before I um, wrote my response to the landscape, as I said, which is a bit more romanticized, whereas his was a much more realistic perspective on how one is engaged in the landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, same to you, Liz. <clears throat> Well, um, as I've said before, I don't write a great deal of poetry, but I do write a lot of prose, but of course prose can be poetry too. I mean, there's, there's nothing to say that because it's not in a particular format or even in free verse that it, it's not poetry. And I think that it, I, have, have to, I have an idea and then I, I just sit down and write about the idea. I mean, I can, and then elaborate up, up, upon that. Um, and it tends to be stories, whether it's for adults or for children, it doesn't matter. Um, um, and I obviously choose the words it, it, and how to express myself, depending on whether they're adults or children I'm writing for. Um, and it, it, that, that's, I have, like you, in, in a way, um, that I have to have a, a spark that makes it work. And suddenly it'll go. And, mm. and, and I could be on a bus or, 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 or walking down the road or, 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 or generally I'm not thinking about writing. And mm. suddenly I think, oh, wow, yes, I, I do that. And I can, I um, mean, I think, I can't remember if I told you, but um, I got an inspiration for the novel that I'm writing at the moment from a picture on a tea towel. All right. <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, funny because you, you said that you were you maybe sitting on a bus or, or whatever, and you, and you get this this spark. I was just about to ask you both if if you are if you're if whatever you're doing, whether it's doing some gardening, whether it's doing a we are walking or something, and you see something, and that gives you that spark. Because when I'm out on my walks at the moment, um, because I've started doing this bit of writing. Um, I'm looking around me more, although I'm, I'm always looking around me in the countryside or wherever I am, I'm looking more now to see if I can get some inspiration from something I'm seeing um, yeah. and, and then bring that back with me and then um, try and make a mental note of it, which is not a good idea for me because I keep forgetting things. <laughs> and always carry a note <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, um, and that's one thing I'm always being told of. Always have a notebook with you. Um, so that's that's what you I'm trying to do. You can always take a picture, you know. You can always take a yes, picture. exactly. Yeah, and I've always got a camera, camera with me. So on our phones all the time. Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah. So that's that's the way I'm trying to think of things at the moment. Um, uh, uh, to tr to try and get some sort of more inspiration to do more writing because I I am enjoying the writing side of it. Mm. Good. Good. That's great. It's because I, when I was at school, I was all my my English was always my best subject, and I was always being given. I know I know <laughs> punctuation is not one of my best things at the moment at all. But when I was at school, I was very good at all that sort of thing. I was always being given great comments on my our school reports and things like that for my stories. So it's always been something that's there. Um, and it was more stories than anything. I never wrote prose or poems or anything. Um, but I suppose as I'm getting older, um, my, my thought processes are changing. So, um, and when I do write, um, um, I, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Good. And I, and I think that's good. You know, it, it, yeah, it keeps it the old grey cells going a bit. <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a, a couple of people have said to me, when I did the very first one, which you both saw, and that was about war, two people that I know very well, both messaged me and said, did you really write that? Because that's not something we, we expected from you. Um, and for me, that's, that's a sort of a backhanded compliment. And uh, um, so, it's uh, so I, I do enjoy it. So, but you, uh, you, you, I know Liz, you 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 write your novels and things like that. And uh, uh, but have you ever thought of 
putting um, poems into a book to, to make a book? Well, I don't write enough poetry of my own, I think, to oh. actually put it in a book. It would be a very slim novel, um, a, a slim uh, volume. And um, so, no, I haven't. I mean, I'm, I tend to, as I think you know, concentrate on, on prose, uh, yep. apart from everything else. But, oh. uh, but I love reading poetry and um, I tend to, and I post a poem on Facebook every day with a friend of mine, with a photograph. Um, and which uh, we've been doing that actually for five years tomorrow. So oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, so it's an anniversary for us. Nice. Um, and, and that's been wonderful, you know, mm. and, and um, obviously I started with poets and poems that I knew myself and, and it's gone on from there. So I, I've, I've increased my knowledge of poetry, <laughs> which, was, uh, which was quite a lot to start with actually, but, but no, I, writers, particularly American writers. I mean, I, I, some of the American writers, modern ones, are just wonderful. And you just, I, I don't personally associate poetry with America, and uh, which is ridiculous. Um, but so I've been very well slapped over the wrist over that. <laughs> and we, and uh, we, we know that you've got that, that little book there of, of yours, Andrew. Oh, is Andrew frozen? Oh, no, no he's okay. back, no, he's back, he's back. Um, okay. Yeah, because you've got, you've obviously um, got your book there that you've got at the side of you. But have you have you thought about doing more, Andrew, and, and putting the, these into into more books? Well, I tend to fluctuate between writing and painting, and at the moment I'm going through a spate of painting. Um, oh. The pictures behind you are of a dew pond, and it's the last dew pond left in the village, which I'm trying to save from being filled in. When the, the, the people came to lay the tarmac on the road, they covered the track and put tarmac over it. All the excess um, aggregate, they pushed into this last dew pond. So I've been clearing it out and, and, and suddenly I found this way into painting. So I've been painting furiously yeah. this, this dew pond, building up a series of paintings, which I hope to exhibit. Um, as yet, I have not um, written anything about the DuPont, but one, one of my viewers, a lady called Jean Blemings, uh, was inspired enough to write a poem about the DuPont, and then I orchestrated it and added music to it. So yeah. I like the way that an idea can reach out to other people and, and inspire them and, and get them involved in, in this project. Yeah, it's absolutely. Not a just about painting, you know, it, it hopefully will encompass all kinds of manifestations in, in painting, in writing, in performance, you know, it, it, it is um, a, a lot of possibilities there. Well, I, I've seen your, I've seen your um, videos and, and things about, about, about that Dupont. And yeah. when, when I've been out on my walks, I'm very saddened to see all these beautiful old mm -hmm. village Dew ponds literally just being left and they're covered and I just wish people would bring them back to life again because they they're a vital part of of the sort of for, for, for wildlife and things like that and it's well, it, you know and again that's where you could get an inspiration for for writing a poem or something like that absolutely absolutely I mean th this dew pond was a, a, a crucial part of the agrarian past you know it was a pond where the cows when they were leading the cows to pasture they would stop off and and have a drink oh. so it's it's not just about nostalgia because it's the only source of open water uh where the frogs used to thrive and unfortunately when they pushed in a lot of this aggregate they blocked off the regular water source coming from a natural spring so it only fills up with water in, in winter time and, and early spring, and then it dries out for, for summer. So for me, it's important to, to, to be in the village and to photograph it, to film it while there is water in there, because the, the reflection, uh, it, it looks very black mm. and it reflects the, the sky and the trees above beautifully, as you can perhaps see. Yeah. But um, for me, it, it's a vital part of the, the village's history. So I'm very keen to preserve it. Mm. And, and, it out, so yeah, it. yeah. And what and what the, 
And again, I don't know whether this is a way my thought process is changing is as you were talking about the, the dew pond and you were using certain words, reflection and things like that, that's, that's made me think, oh, perhaps I could write something about reflection um, yeah. from, from water and things like that. But again, the reflection can be a, a use for, for a different process, couldn't it? Um, yeah, it's so something a way, like into, that. A way yeah. into another another perspective on it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think uh, I'm getting worried now because my my, my... <laughs> if people if people that knew me could hear me talking like this, they were going, "What is wrong with you?" <laughs> um, but uh, somebody else that follows me, and I, I won't use her name at the moment. Um, uh, has has been emailing me, and it's and it's uh, I can't remember if it stemmed from our first chat about poems. Um, but it turns out this person has been writing poems um, and she sent me a very, very short two or three line one the other day. And I got an email from her yesterday. Um, and I'd, I'd mentioned in, in an email to her that I had sat and, and written a couple of pieces and she asked if she could, could read them. And I have sent them to her. Um, and she read them through yesterday, and she said she's going to read them through again today. And she has asked me if, if she can send me more poems. Um, so now I'm thinking perhaps if we're getting, the, you know, the three of us, if we're getting people to start thinking about prose and poems and things like that, perhaps that's something that I can try and introduce into either my Facebook group or into my YouTube channel to encourage people to put, sit down and write something and, and send it to, to me and then, and then include it into, into more um, YouTube uh, videos or, as I say, my Facebook page. Um, I don't Absolutely. know what you, I don't, yeah, I was going to say, what do, you, what do you two think about that? No, I think it's a great idea. You know, the more people who are creating, who are writing or even painting, you know, it benefits us all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would yeah. say exactly the same thing. Yeah. 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 So, so I'm, I'm, I'm rather pleased that, sorry. <laughs> and, and if this is stemmed from our first conversation, our first Zoom chat, um, and it's encouraged her to, to do this, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm really chuffed that that's what we've, um, between the three of us, have, have, have achieved. If we get one more yes. person writing, um, yes. that's fantastic. Yes. Um, it's like so, inspiring pupils, isn't it? Sorry, say again. Yeah. It's like inspiring pupils. Yes, yes, it is. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Liz, when when are you going to sit down and record your your poem for us? Oh, whenever you like, really. Yes. Well, yes. as soon as you can get it to me, the better. Right. And then I can I can right. then get this. Um, I can get it all processed up and. Uh, and things like that, and I can get it onto onto the channel for everybody to see. Um, yeah. And then, of course, we, you both need to get your thinking caps on for spring, and then oh, for I'm summer. Right. So you <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> there, there's a wealth of poems out there which we could we could uh, record for you. No problem. Um, so, Liz, can you please tell me what it was that made you or give you the inspiration to choose the piece? of winter that you have? Yes, well, um, whenever I have an opportunity to share Shakespeare or um, with people, I do. Um, and, some, and The Winter's Tale, which is the piece that's coming from, from, from that play, is not a play that people know in the way that they would do Hamlet or Lear or Merchant of Venice, for example. Um, I was very fortunate in, in being given this particular play as one of my, um, um, A-level texts uh, to learn, and Leah was the other one, and and so I got to know it pretty well pretty early on. I also had a um, a workshop at RADA, um, which also um, involved um, a winter's tale um, when I was a student, and um, so it went on from there. And well, being winter, I thought, why not? choose a bit of the winter's tale and and the play very much of two halves as i said um the first part is 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 the winter bit and the second half is is summer yeah and this this bit here is a speech 
by the Queen, who's been okay. treated very badly by her husband. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this is more from, a, is, is this actually a poem from the play or is this just a segment from the play itself? It's a segment from, from the play. It's, it's mm -hmm. her speech. Uh, the Queen is uh, falsely accused of adultery. Mm -hmm. um, uh, her husband just has a mental aberration and um, is very sorry and is punished for it too, actually. Um, and she stands, she's dragged into the dock, having just had another baby. Mm -hmm. um, and she pleads her case. And, um, and it, it's a wonderful speech, that's all. Really? And it very much typifies this first part of, the, of A Winter's Tale in yeah. the wintry section, if I can yeah. put it that way. My poetry choice on the subject of winter, I have chosen a speech from Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale. This is very much a play of two halves, um, dark to start with and the dark gloominess of, of winter and bitter cold and the second half very much in the summer. It's a wonderful play. I'm very fond of it and it also, it actually contains one of the most famous, or perhaps the famous, most famous stage direction in history, namely Exit, pursued by a bear. This scene is before that, however. Hermione speaks from the dock. Sir, spare your threats. The bug which you would fright me with, I seek. To me can life be no commodity. The crown and comfort of my life, your favour, I do give lost, for I do feel it gone, but know not how it went. My second joy and first fruits of my body from his presence, I am barred like one infectious. My third comfort, starred most unluckily, is from my breast, the innocent milk in its most innocent mouth hailed out to murder. Myself, on every post, proclaimed a strumpet with immodest hatred, the childbed privilege denied, which belongs to women of all fashion. Lastly, hurried here to this place in the open air before I have got strength of limit. Now, my liege, tell me what blessings I have here alive, that I should fear to die, therefore proceed. But yet, hear this, mistake me not, my life, I prize it not a straw, but for mine honour, which I would free, if I shall be condemned upon surmises, all proofs sleeping else, but what your jealousies awake, I tell you, Tis rigour and not law. Your honours all, I do refer me to the oracle. Apollo be my judge. So, so Andrew, can you, can you tell me about the choices or choice that you've made um, about uh, uh, your, your poem? Right, my, my second choice is a very short poem by Edward Thomas. It's just four lines long called Thor. And what I liked about this poem is that he managed to capture in just a few lines this sense that nature is, uh, has a better vantage point, has a better position to observe nature than we as humans do. Yeah. And this poem uh, is spoken from the point of view of a bird in the sky or up in the tree that is able to notice that winter is passing. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I like that sense that, um, you know, he's outlining a, a human weakness, that we can't yeah. see actually what is on the ground, what is under our feet. Yeah, sure. And this, and this is also uh, brought up in a poem which he wrote called Bird's Nests. And I'll just read one stanza for you. Okay, yeah, please do. It, it, it illustrates this point as well quite nicely. Sure. It's called Bird's Nests, and it's the second stanza, and he writes, Since there's no need of eyes to see them with, I cannot help a little shame that I missed most, even at eye level, till the leaves blew off 
and made the seeing no gain, no game. Over the land freckled with snow half thawed, the speculating rooks at their nests cawed, and saw from elm tops delicate as flower of grass, what we below could not see, winter pass. So yeah. he's, he's saying that, you know, as much as he loves nature, <clears throat> he's expressing his human failings, human fallibility, that it was only in winter that he was able to observe these nests in the trees. Sure. And that he really, that he hoped that because of his connection with nature, that he would be able to observe them at any time of the year. Yeah, but yeah. It was only in winter when there are no leaves left on the trees that he was able to uh, observe the nest. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. That that make, makes complete sense, and uh, it it's it fits very nicely with what a winter's about, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, everything is laid bare for us mm. to to see. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I share his point of view that I wish that I was I could be more observant. Of, well, of I think I, I think I think all of us can be more observant. Um, well, indeed, yeah. When it when it when it comes to things like nature and things like that, and, and I think I've said before um, that people walk along with this very blink blinkered view that everything, as far as they're concerned, is just what's in front of them. Indeed. Instead of opening their eyes to see what's around them as as they're going along, yeah. it doesn't matter I whether mean, it's a, it doesn't matter whether, whether it's a building or a tree. Or what it is, it's it, yeah. there's more there than just that little bit of pavement that you're walking along. I know if you observe people walking through the streets, there they are invariably looking in their phones or they're yeah. looking at the ground. Yeah, yeah. And I think so, you, you miss so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and Edward Thomas, he he shows us that we need to, you know, look around us to observe even the smallest detail. Yeah, and I think that comes true when you talked about your dupon, um, you know, because that that could have been uh, was you know partly covered up and and you couldn't see what was there. I know, and it, it's it's at the end of the village where nobody walks, but I walk every day walking the dogs, and I, I passed it every day. And in summer, I would pick the blackberries because it was full of brambles. Mm. But uh, when I started the project, I, I cleared all the undergrowth away. And I, I cleaned the, the pool part and I dug out various bottles and old buckets and even two fishing rods. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, the pool is so small. I mean, I don't know what anyone expected to, to catch in that. Winter by Kevin Hall. The signs of winter are here the first snow, the first flakes that flutter from the sky. They drift, they swirl, they land, those mostly little snowflakes. Those snowflakes cover the ground, the trees, the bushes, those little tiny snowflakes. It is cold, very cold, as those little tiny snowflakes fall from the sky. As those little tiny snowflakes land, they freeze on the ground and on the trees, and on the bushes. The birds shiver in the cold. Those birds are oh so cold. The birds are covered by those little tiny snowflakes. The cats and dogs chase around the gardens, trying to catch those little tiny snowflakes as they fall from the sky. The sheep in the fields shelter against a wall or in the trees. They are cold, they are very hungry. They are covered by the freezing little snowflakes. The farmer comes to give them food, to keep them alive, but no shelter for the farmer from the cold and those tiny little snowflakes. The roads are slippery, the paths are slippery. Be careful out there. Don't fall because of those tiny little snowflakes. The wind blows, the trees shake and sway, and those little tiny snowflakes drift to the ground. The children play, they run and slide on the frozen slippery snow. And as they do, they leave footprints in the snow. But those little tiny snowflakes soon feel their footprints left in the snow. 
The children throw snowballs made from those little tiny frozen snowflakes. The hands are cold and red. Now warm them by the fire, mother cries, as they do those little tiny snowflakes get bigger and it covers the land far and wide. Roads blocked, schools closed, can daddy get to work? Whatever next for those bigger, much bigger snowflakes? Drifts, drifting, sledging, snowball fights, snow plows clear the roads. Some are fun, some are not. Those bigger, much bigger snowflakes keep falling and freezing. Winter is here. If you just enjoyed watching Kevin's latest video on his Kevin's Rambles channel, do give him a thumbs up. Consider liking and subscribing, and that way you'll be kept notified of all future videos, as we are in that right, Zorro.